It is an honor and a privilege to be here. It's a, it's a privilege to stand in this office, in this pulpit, to speak, and we don't take it lightly, and so we just want to say thank you. Uh, as Pastor was saying, my name is John McCluey. Uh, my family, I'm super blessed. I'm six foot eight, but I married way over my head uh, with my wife, Dee, Dee. Um, and we have two amazing kids, Sarah Nadine, who's 14, who's in the service, and then James has gone off to the kids' service, who's 11. And so I am a blessed man, and I'm going to let Didi share a little bit about what we do in Colombia. We, um, we minister to one of South America's largest unreached people groups. Uh, in Colombia, they make up the largest unreached people group, and that's the deaf. Um, unreached people group, when we say that term, what does that really mean? It means less than 2% of that population, that group, know Jesus. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, for that less than 2% to evangelize effectively the other 98%. And so they need help. And so we say thank you. Your church supports us and helps us as we go in and do that. But it's a challenge because sign language is not universal. So in Colombia, the Colombian they use is different than the sign language they use here in the United States. And I don't know if you know this or not, but anytime you face a challenge, God will provide you an opportunity to bring him glory and honor. And so we're so thankful for the opportunity to minister to and serve the deaf in Colombia and Didi, I'll let you share. Yes, thank y'all so much, just as John has said. We just, we are so thankful for all of you and for this wonderful church and yeah. just for the family of God. Even though y'all don't know our names or sometimes missionaries all the way around the world, you play such a big part in what we are doing in yeah. Columbia and for missionaries all around the world because your prayers matter. The prayers of the saints, they avail much. And we just thank you so, so much just for being the family of God. And just as John said, we just want to thank our pastors and um, Miss Marilyn and um, Brother Ken and just all of you, y'all just shine with the love of Jesus. We have just felt so blessed in our hearts, so encouraged from being here. And a precious lady just earlier, she just spoke came and just gave me a word from the Lord, and it was just what I needed. I just want to say thank you so much for being obedient to the Lord. And I, I just want to share real quick about the ladies' ministry in Columbia and what the Lord is doing. Um, when we got to Columbia, I had studied sign la American Sign Language in um, in college, and I was the deaf education teacher in the public school, so American Sign Language, I mean, I know pretty well, but in Colombia, the sign language is different, and we got there, and we had only been there about a month or so, and the pastor of the deaf church, he asked would I start meeting with um, one lady. I just started, like, a discipleship group, and I said, um, I said, Pastor William, I don't really know sign language. You know, I'm learning it, but I know American, not Colombian, but Pastor William, who John will tell y'all about later. He's, he's Colombian and he's deaf and he's the pastor of the church, but he kept signing to me, no, no, the Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit will lead you. So I was like, okay. I was so nervous. And like in two days, I mean, I had to um, meet with her. I mean, I knew her, but I had to meet with her and we were starting to study the Bible. So I called friends from home, prayer warriors, and I said, please pray. I have to learn a whole language in two days. But, <laughs> but... The Holy Spirit always goes before us, and, and Jesus only asks for our obedience. He doesn't ask us to be the perfect speakers or know every sign. He just asks us to just go and be obedient in whatever he has called us to do. And um, the first lady that I started meeting with, her name was Jennifer. And Jennifer, she comes from a very, very difficult background. She's deaf and the only Christian in her family, and she lives in the most dangerous part of Bogota. But, and she will travel two hours to get to church. But as I started meeting with her, I would always apologize. I was like, Jennifer, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm learning, I'm learning. But she would always say, she would say, Tranquila, when she would sign. And she would say, if you will teach me the Bible, I will teach you sign language. Yeah. And that spoke so much to my heart. I was like, okay, Jesus, I'm just obedient. <laughs> and so she... She just encouraged my heart so much. But from meeting with her, just Jennifer and I, the group started out. The Lord, by the time we left Columbia, the group had grown to 40 ladies. And it surely... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is from our um, very first deaf conference that we had in Columbia. And this was made possible by all of you. Yeah. Your church supported this Thank conference you. and provided all the funds for these precious, precious 
deaf ladies and a lot of men too to come. So we just want to tell you, thank you, thank you. And these ladies, I mean, all of them, if, I mean, I could tell you a story about each one of them. They're just such precious ladies. And as you can see, they're young. They, some of them are just 18 and they're really young. But <clears throat> when we started telling them when we were planning the conference, you know, they were saying, oh, they were telling Pastor William, like, we can't afford to go to this, you know, it was like $10. But then um, Pastor William said, oh, a church from the United States is going to help. A church is, you know, going to uh, make a way for you to go. And the ladies, I mean, they would be in tears because they would, they would ask John and I, why would a church in the United States care about us so much? Why would they love us enough to do this? Yeah. So I just want you to know you were making such a huge difference. And even though you may never know any of their names or you may never know them, I know that when you get to heaven, some of them, they're going to say, thank you. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for letting them go because many of them, they accepted Jesus for the first time. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I mean, the Lord did great things there. And it was because of your faithfulness and obedience and just y'all's heart for missions, your wonderful pastors and Miss Marilyn. So thank you, thank you. You matter so much to all missionaries around the world and people who are waiting to know Jesus for the first time. I made a mistake in the first service. I, I talked about this video, this thank you video we were going to show, and then I got done preaching, and Didi's like, you didn't show the video. So I'm going to try to do a better job of not doing that. We do have a couple more slides I'm, I wanted to show you. Um, what are we doing there amongst the deaf? Um, we, our heart, our passion is to really empower the deaf there. The deaf oftentimes get marginalized and overlooked and looked down upon, and so to be welcomed into their community is a big honor, and, and we feel like the, the, what God wants us to empower them, because the deaf can reach the deaf so much more effectively than we can. I mean, we're just still learning. Even in, even in the deaf church, we had an honor to go speak at just a little bit ago. I mean, we are so, I mean, just green and so hungry to learn, but God, like Didi said, if you'll be obedient, if you'll just do what the Lord's called you to do, he will provide, he will equip, he will show you, and he will use you in ways you never dreamed possible. I'm living proof of that. And so when we go, we, we begin to teach the Bible. Um, they're so hungry for the word. It's so exciting to teach the word. And then afterwards, I mean, they just have hundreds of questions they want to know. We have to just, like stop our time because they, 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 we can't get them all answered. But they're so hungry for what's in God's word. They want to do what God tells them to do. They don't want to do the things that God tells them not to do. And it's so refreshing and exciting. But it's also we believe that God is moving amongst the deaf. Because the need is, is worldwide. It's not just in Colombia or in the United States. It's all over the world. God is really moving amongst the deaf. I, like, I can't tell you how many churches I've gone to that somebody says, you know, just this last week or this last month, God is really putting a burden on my heart for the deaf. I don't even know why. And because the Lord cares about the one. Luke 15 talks about it. We're going to talk about it in just a little bit. But he cares about the one. The ones that have been oftentimes overlooked and marginalized, he cares about the one. And you might be that one person today in this service, and I just want you to know that God cares about you. He loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I know those words are cliche, but they're the truth. God loves you. He absolutely does. And so I think we've got a few more pictures that we can go through, and then we'll show that video I promised to show you today. This is our uh, group of, there's 13 different groups around Columbia. None of them except for the one is a church. They're just deaf groups and they want to be established as, as churches, but they need to be trained. These leaders need to be trained up as, as deaf pastors. And so we want to work with Pastor William to do a seminary that's for the deaf, not just hearing where they have to get a translator to come, but we, we can teach them and turn that over to them that they can teach it to the other deaf. And so uh, we're, we, when we get back, that's what we plan on doing. I think the next slide is um, just me. We had to use Zoom. I don't know if anybody else had to use Zoom. Uh, when we were in lockdown, it was a year and almost a half. They just started meeting in person this year in like January or February. They've been meeting via Zoom this whole time. And so it's been a blessing. It's not the same. When we got back to the States, I, I was so excited to be in the house of the Lord to be amongst other people, to walk up. I mean, we're huggers, we're from the South, so if you get a hug from us, you can just tell us not to and we'll respect that, but we wanna, we wanna be in contact with people. We wanna be face-to-face -face with people and it's hard when you're doing it via Zoom, but we praise God, 20 years ago, what would we have done? You know, we, we thank God for that. And then I think uh, the last thing is uh, the, our team, our ministry team. And so this is the ministry team that we work with. We are so blessed, they're so patient and good to us. Uh, the couple on the right that you'll see there in the yellow shirt, 
Uh, Didi began to minister with them, and she's a big helper uh, to Didi with, with the discipleship group. But they begin to feel like God is kind of moving upon their hearts to be missionaries. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the Assemblies of God recently approved the deaf to be uh, individuals and couples to be approved as fully appointed missionaries now with, amongst the Assemblies of God. Probably something that should have been done decades ago, but praise the Lord that they can do it now because we, we want to encourage the deaf to go because, again, like they're, they're, the way that they and their capability of ministering to the deaf, it is just uncanny. It is incredible, and we want to empower them and, and get them sent off. And so we just be praying that the Lord would call the right one. That's right, sister. That's right. I see that. We, we praise God for that. And so your church is a big part of that. I, I say that because when we did this first conference, we're kids pastors, and so we're trying to think of ways on how we minister to the deaf. You can't just go to a neighborhood like we could in, amongst kids ministry and invite all the kids to come out and play. I mean, you can do that in Columbia, but when you're dealing with the deaf, there might just be one deaf family in that community and then one deaf family in this community. And so how do you, how do you, you know, do an event to bring them in? And the best way we thought was, let's do something like kids camp. Let's get a, 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 a center or someplace they can all come to and they stay for three or four days and we do training and then we do games and we do fellowship and we eat together and we do services where we get to apply what we learned in their day. And I'm telling you, God moved. And it's possible because you, this church gave. The other thing that we want to say thank you for is I think today we we're raising money for Wycliffe. What do Wycliffe do? They do Bible interpretations. And for us, uh, the deaf, it's, it's unique. Uh, oftentimes we get asked, well, why can't we just hand the Bible to the deaf? Because can't they read? Well, sure, but it's not their language. It's a different language and they're a visual language. And so what does Wycliffe do? They, they like have been to translate the Colombian Bi- or the Bible into Colombian sign language. And what's incredible about that is our very pastor, Pastor William, and a lot of the members that go to our church, they work for the, the Bible, Def- Bible Society, which is a, a underneath Wycliffe, to translate the Bible through the week. That's their day job. And so it's made possible because Wycliffe sends funds. And so I know that y'all have sponsored other Bible translations and you're, and you're raising money for that. So I just want to say thank you. It's a, big, it's a big deal. Whenever we're teaching, whenever we can show the Bible uh, what they've already interpreted, it is so much more clear and understanding. I don't know about you. There, there's times I read the Bible and it's like challenging for me, right? I'm reading, I'm like, wait a second, I got to double take and reread that and, and see. So you can imagine if it's in another language. Mine's in Spanish. And so sometimes I'll try to look over there and read it in Spanish and it's challenging when it's not your heart language. And so, again, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, it is incredible to have a Bible. We take it for granted to have the Bible in our heart language that we can pick up and read and hide God's word in our heart. But they're able to do that because of your generosity. So thank you for that. So if, if I could speak this morning on something, it's, it's just the missions is the heartbeat of God. Uh, Luke nineteen ten says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his purpose. That is his heart. And so we begin to ask, how do we reach the world? How do we reach our neighborhood, our, our, our job, our co-work? How do we reach our family? How do we do that? And then the other question is, do we really want to? Everybody wants to reach the lost, but we've come in such a culture where we like to say things, but our actions oftentimes, and I'm super guilty of this, don't always back that up. Um, I tell my wife I love her all the time on the phone and every other time, but I can promise you my actions don't always back up of what I say. And so do our actions back up when we say the lost are important to us? The Great Commission is clear that it's not an option for the believer or the follower of Christ. It's a mandate. It's a command. And so the Assemblies of God does a a real good job. Uh, As former children's pastors, we talk about like three areas that we talk about with missions. And it's really simple. It's just praying, giving, and going. We teach that to our kids uh, so that way that our kids have a heart for missions and a heart for giving and, and doing. And I didn't know this statistic until I was doing a BGMC tour that 90% of missionaries on the field, 90% held a BGMC buddy barrel in their hand when they were a kid. 90%. What if we got more buddy barrels into more kids' hands? Because I can tell you one thing, our missionary group number, it is not growing, it is shrinking. And we have a whole generation of pioneers that are the most incredible missionaries that are coming off the field because they're just, because of, because of age and because of time that their, their, their ministry is coming to an end. And we don't have the younger couples. I mean, we're not even young anymore. I, I, I feel like I've crossed over that age where I'm like, oh, I'm getting, I'm not that young guy anymore. But we need younger missionaries, people that are called and burdened for those, not just the deaf, for, for all sorts, all over the world. So, praying. Praying works. It's powerful. It's effective. It's awesome. 
Acts 12, it's one of a favorite story of mine that we see that Herod has already put to death James, we see there, and it's pleased the Jews. And so he's like, man, I'm going to do that again. And so he, he rests Peter and he, and he locks Peter up tight in prison. And what does the church begin to do? What the church should be doing is they begin to pray. They begin to intercede and pray for Peter. And, and if you don't know this story, it's an awesome story. It's in Acts 12. You should read it. Like the chains begin to fall off Peter in the middle of the night. It's just like this miraculous miracle. And I, I've heard it so many times as a kid that I, sometimes I forget the details. The chains just fell off. He walked out. Every door opened. And then the city, I mean, the city gate, that's like massive usually and can take multiple people open. The Bible says it just opened. And he was able to walk right back to the house where those, those, the church was praying and interceding for him. And you know, they didn't even, at first he knocks on the door and they're so intent in praying. That's where I want to be caught, right? So intent praying that maybe, you know, that the miracles already happened. God's already done it, but I'm so intently praying. We know that the Bible tells us in James chapter five, the prayers of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I don't know if you've ever read that before or not. The enemy kind of plays with me sometimes like, but are you really righteous? So if I'm not really righteous, then is my prayer really powerful and effective? But I like the way the NCV puts in this. It says this, when a believing person prays, great things happen. I might not be the most righteous person in the world, but you know what? God justifies me and, and where I am weak and where I am not worthy, he comes in like a rushing flood and, and covers over all those iniquities. And your prayers do count. They are powerful and they are effective. It doesn't matter if you feel like they're bouncing off the, the roof above your head. They matter and they are effective and you need to keep on doing it. You have no idea the power that your prayers, if the enemy can get you to stop, then he's in essence taking some sort of uh, a weapon out of your hands to fight. We've just given it up because you've been deceived that your prayer doesn't matter. When we were in uh, Venezuela, the, the turmoil between the two countries, they, uh, the United States had put Venezuela on the terrorist watch list. So then the Venezuelans were, were kind of irritated. So when it came time for us to renew our visa, uh, they didn't want to renew it. And so it's kind of discouraging. We sell everything we were at. We were actually working with kids ministry at that time. And we're just like, Lord, Oh, it's just so frustrating. Like, what, what are we doing? And I, I remember sending the, the messages out to prayer warriors in our church saying, please pray for us. And Miss Nell Jacobs from Butler, Alabama, a little bitty, like little bitty town in the middle of nowhere in Alabama. She begins to pray and she says, this is the message that God, the word that God sent for me. It's like, be still and know that I'm God. And real soon you're going to know what you're supposed to do. And I, I promise you, I mean, I think Didi's faith was a lot stronger than mine. I was like, sure, sure. You know, that soon can be like, I mean, I've read the Bible, like time for the Lord is way different than time for me. It could be a day, it could be a month, it could be a year, you know, we'd be waiting for this, um, this soon message that the Lord is going to send to us. But the next day, uh, we were doing this last outreach. We're there for a couple more weeks. We're in this last outreach. And at the end of this outreach, this teenage boy, Larry, comes up to Dee Dee and says, uh, hi, I'm Larry. I want you to meet my sister. And so as they're walking over to meet the sister, he stops and turns and says, oh, by the way, he's hearing. And so he says, and by the way, she's deaf. And so Dee Dee just begins to burst and cry. I mean, she just knows, like, this is like the sign that the Lord is sending us. And she's crying. And so he doesn't understand that, though. So he's like, oh, wow, you're really excited to meet my sister. And uh, they go over and meet, and it begins this relationship where we begin to ask her, at the end, um, like, what, what are some signs, you know, for this and for, for Redeem or Savior, the things that, we, that you might know if you'd gone to church? And she, she responded back. It's kind of a three-way, like, she would sign to her brother. He would interpret it in Spanish, and then we would have to, like, ponder it for a little bit because our Spanish wasn't super good. <laughs> so it's like this, like, three-way communication going back and forth. But when we asked, she signed back to, to Larry, and Larry told us, she said, we don't know. We've never met a Christian who knows sign language. Not that there's not deaf ministry in Venezuela, but this one girl in the middle of like rural Venezuela didn't know because there was nobody that could effectively communicate the gospel to her. And so thankfully we were able to communicate it with her, which then kind of broke our heart because we were still going to have to leave, but all because of prayer, like the Lord will guide and direct your steps. That Lord cared about latest so much that he would allow us, who are we? We are just people obedient to him to go and be able to minister to her on our journey and then when we were there the last three weeks, it got really bad. Uh, I got a phone call one night. I was washing dishes. Dee was at the table, and she answered the phone call. And our leaders, which happened to be my aunt and uncle, Pat and Gary Heine, she called and said, hurry, tell John to come quick. They're, 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 there's a bunch of guys breaking into our apartment. They've got guns. They're shooting. And um, tell them to come quick. And so uh, we, we, I drop everything. I run out, and I yell at the other men because we live down below in the valley. They lived up on the mountainside. And 
and I, and I start hollering at the other, the house parents, the fathers to come, and we're going to go and see if we can scare these guys away. And as we're driving up, the ladies, the mothers, and the kids begin to pray and begin to intercede. And, you know, there's a moment of adrenaline where you make an act like that, and you're like, yeah, we got to go do something. And we get up on, and I, I, I think I've told this more before, and it was, you know, we jumped on the mule and took the mule up, and after church, someone said, you really gotten like a mule, like an animal mule? And uh, it's like the Kawasaki mule, the you know, side by side. So get that. But there is, I can remember going up that way and I can remember about three fourths of the way up there thinking, all we have is this machete that we use to cut grass with and they've got guns and like, what am I doing? And I mean, there is, I'll be honest with you. There was a moment of like, dear Lord, if there's anything in my life, please forgive me of my sins. <laughs> Amen. I just want to make sure, you know, if there's any chance, but those women and those children praying, they scared off the thieves. And not just the thieves, because the things that you steal that are the most valuable as missionaries is not the money and the computers it, per se. It is the passport and the sigil and the paperwork because if you've ever had to deal with paperwork in, in foreign and other countries, it is a nightmare, can be a nightmare. Everything that they got taken that was of value, they were leaving to go to Europe to visit some Venezuelan missionaries the next week. Everything we found outside the house, sigil, a passport, rings that were gifts from the father, everything that, have, that meant something, they dropped as they were scared running away. Now, there was a couple things that got stolen, but all the important things. Why? Because when we pray, God moves. It's awesome. And I think that, yeah, thank you, Lord. But I think there's a prayer that really touches the heart of God. When we begin to talk about things that he's passionate about, I don't know about you, but I could talk. <laughs> I get, to, he's like, you talking a lot. Like, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be quiet and listen. But when we talk about things we're passionate about, I, I could talk about sports or, or th James, my, my son, he likes Marvel comics. And so we can talk about that because we're passionate. We like those things. You know, if you're a cook, you talk about recipes and the things that you use and maybe whether that copper skillet thing on TV works where the egg slides right off. I, you know, hunting in, in Alabama, it's crazy. It's true. We, we are a little bit different in Alabama. But they talk about hunting, where they go, and fishing, and, and all those things. But when we begin to talk about the things that are important to God, I, I believe that God really hears us. He talks about it. When we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5, 14 says, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God. The very thing, if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And then John 6 38 says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those that he has given me, but raise them all, raise them up at the last day. That was his purpose, his will. You have to believe that God loves it when we talk about the lost. And not just talk about it, but we do something about it. There's a story, a missionary, um, a dear missionary, the missionary that came to the church when Didi was 17 to talk to her about the need of, of deaf ministry. When she was 17 and God put a burden on her heart that would take her on this wild journey where she would meet this Missouri boy and at CBC and it's a wild story. We don't have time to tell it, but it is incredible how God directs her steps. But this missionary would told a story when he was in Honduras one time that he was doing some work on his back porch and he was doing some electrical work. And if you're, if, here there's codes and, and, and things that keep things pretty steady. I, I, I worked as a, with an electrician when I was home, but it can be dangerous, especially overseas. It's not up to those codes and you can get hurt real bad if you're not careful. And he got caught up in some, uh, some wiring and he couldn't get off. And if you ever know what that is, it's, it'll grab you and you can't go. And if there's not somebody to knock you off, then you can die. And he was hung up and he said, I, I was literally realizing I was dying but I could hear this, this voices and, and like these voices and I couldn't make them out. But as I was getting closer and closer to dying, I began to hear these voices louder and louder and louder. And his wife says, I don't know what it was. The Lord just told me in that moment that I need to go in there. And I saw, and I don't even know how I knew what to do, but I just knew I needed to go turn the power off. And she did. And it saved his life. But when asked about it, he said, as I began to uh, like hear it, as it became louder and louder, I, I realized it was the voice of the saints praying and interceding. When you see that picture of a missionary on your, on your refrigerator and you're getting up in the morning and you're just grabbing it and you're saying some little quick prayer, you think, might think that doesn't matter, but it does matter. I can't tell you how many times we've been on the field that it's been like discouraging where we want to like give up and quit. You know, I said that the first service, like I can handle attack versus me, but when the enemy starts attacking your children, I wasn't prepared for that. And I can remember thinking, Lord, what are we going to do? Like, do we, and somebody would send a message on Facebook Messenger. 
and say, hey, I don't know why, but the Lord's placed you on our hearts to pray. And it works. It really works. Prayer connects us with the heartbeat of God. It connects us with his passion. And I think the more that we talk about that, the more we become passionate about that. Have you ever been around somebody who's passionate about something? The next thing you know, you found out you're like, you're like sucked up into their passion and you don't even, that's, that's why I want to be with the Lord. I want to be, I just want to be so passionate about the things he's passionate about. It's life-giving. The next is giving. Amy Carmichael, a missionary to India said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Sorry, my mouth gets dry when I get nervous. So, um, giving, the thing that everybody loves to hear pastors talk about, right? But the truth of it is, is if, if we don't talk about it, if we don't present the opportunity, then you never really know what it is to live a blessed life. I say that from a missionary, like, yeah, 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 you're a missionary, but I, I, I grew up in an AG church. I gave to missionaries that came to our church back when they would bring the cool, I'm sorry, I didn't have the long snake to roll out. You know, the missionaries used to bring, but I, as I grew up giving, and then we became children's pastors, and we gave through. I see what giving does, and you know what? It's not even always about money. Oftentimes in our society, the thing that's even more precious than money is our time. I mean, we'll, give, we'll, throw, we'll write a check out here and just give it. I mean, I, I know lots of people like that. It was just easier to give a, a cash something than it is to give your time. We, were, we grew up pretty poor. Missouri, and I, but I remember my, my dad would always do anything for every, anybody. I mean, he, we, the things that we did at the time to my chagrin, but I find myself doing those very same things as an adult that he would do. Isn't that funny how you do those things? But we would never ask for anything. We would do, but we would never ask. And I've come to realize that that's really just pride. You can be poor and proud just as you can be rich and proud. Um, but it's, so then what does the Lord call us to do? He calls us to be missionaries. So then we have to go around every week and ask for things for people. Um, and our coach that where they give us and they assigned us before we became fully appointed missionaries, his name is Adam Artisan, and he is actually from Indiana, from Goshen, I think, which isn't too very far from here. But I, I was talking to him one day, I was like, I, I don't like doing this. I don't like asking. And he said, are the deaf and the lost, are they worth you feeling awkward? I was like, it just changed my perspective of that. I mean, it doesn't make it necessarily super easy, but it, I'm like, they are. Those deaf people that you see, I mean, they're dear friends of mine. I mean, I cry almost every time I watch that video because I want to get back and I want to be with them and, and minister there and do life with them. But they are totally worth me feeling awkward. Absolutely. If it can do something to help them get them closer to the Lord, that we can get more deaf, then it's totally worth me doing that. And really, it just boils down to this. We have two kind of hearts. The Bible talks about it, right? A greedy heart and a giving heart. The greedy heart we see in Luke chapter 12 and 18. In chapter 12, it's the rich fool who has this great harvest and he's like, what am I gonna do with all this stuff? And his first thought is, I'm just gonna tear down my silos and build bigger silos so that way I can have more stuff. And, and then in Luke chapter 18, we see the rich young ruler, right? Who does all that. He's like, I mean, the man's so close to getting to experience his best life. He comes and asks and Jesus says, well, then sell everything that you have and come follow me. And he just walked away because he had a lot of things. It's greed. We can get sucked up and consumed in it. It can ruin our life because Luke chapter 12, verses 15 says, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. I've fallen victim to that myself. You start looking around and you start thinking, oh, you know, retirement's coming up and we need things, things. And, I need, and then when I realize, wait a second, who is my provider? I can work so hard and it can all be gone so frivolously in a moment in the times that we live in, or I can just put my trust in him. I need to be a good steward, don't get me wrong, we all do. But if we trust God, who does, he takes care of us. Don't worry about what you can possibly give, just be willing to give what God directs you to give. I'm gonna tell you a little secret. It doesn't matter how much you have, it's not enough to reach the need. God's not asking, what God's asking, he's just saying, how connected are you, how connected you are to me and to your pocketbook? How willing are you to give? 2 Corinthians says, if the, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. God's not asking us to do what we can't do. Otherwise, he'll provide it. So if he's asking you to give a million dollars and you don't have a million dollars, then guess what? Some windfall's coming your way, but you better do what God asks you to do when it comes. Okay? But then we have the giving heart. Uh, cool story in John 6, right? Jesus and the disciples have just crossed the Sea of Galilee. There's a, thousands of people like falling around. There's no food. There's no Hardee's, no McDonald's, no nothing to get some food. And they're all hungry. And so instead of sending them off because it's important, like they need to hear this life-giving teaching, this little boy has some loaves and some fish. 
I wonder what was going through his mind. Like, do what now? I, like, we could crumble that all up, and there's not enough for a crumb for everybody. How is this going to be enough? But he gives, just trusting and just gives what he has, the little bit he has, because that's the key. When we give, the Lord will multiply what we give, and it'll be more than enough to meet the need. God doesn't need our money. He needs our willingness and our obedience. Our giving is directly tied to the condition of our heart. It really is the great spiritual litmus test. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew that where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be also. So what do we treasure? I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and have to explain why I hoarded up things when I could have used things to build his kingdom. And I've been guilty of that. So I'm not sitting here browbeating anybody here. I'm saying I don't want to stand before the Lord and have to explain that to him. Jim Elliott once famously said, and it is so true, Jim Elliott, the incredible missionary that I've been to look at, he's like, he's like in his 20s and he's writing just, just and so far beyond his years. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Why do we work so hard to collect stuff here that's going to just be gone one day when we could be working for things that will last for eternity? I'll never know. Finally, this morning uh, is going. So we got praying and we've got giving and now is going. One of my favorite passages in Luke chapter 15, I think we got enough time. What's our time? We are, okay, I want to hurry. I get to talk fast here. This is nice, right? Because in the South, I, I get told to slow down when I'm talking about, <laughs> I do, like, I, I loved your, but you just got to slow down. So I get to speak. We're going to read the parable of the lost son, right? Chapter 15, verses 11 through. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to as a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, that's great, right? He came to his senses, that's what sin will do. He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. While he was a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, What's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I love this story. I love the father in this story. Um, As a kid, I remember growing up and every every sermon I ever heard was about the lost son, you know, because of the sinner that was coming home. But it wasn't until later that I began to learn more about the the Jewish customs and, and traditions there. Uh, we became missionaries. I, I'm, when I say I'm monoculturalistic when I grew up, that means I just know what's here in the rural United States. And when you go overseas, you begin to learn different cultures. And it's awesome to learn the nuances and different things about different cultures. And I love finding out the reasons why different cultures do the things they do. What's the origin of those things? And, but in, in this story, the, Jesus is talking to tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees. That's who he's talking to. So the story talks and ministers to those, that group of people. And everybody here would have known these cultural traditions. So what, is, what, what am I talking about? Well, when we see the story where the son goes off and he's coming back, the, the father is looking for him, right? And when the father sees him, he begins to run. Well, to run, you can't run in the tunics that they would wear. So you have to hitch up your tunic. And by doing so, you would show your legs, which for us, we don't care. We wear shorts everywhere in our culture. And our culture is pretty individual. I mean, we're, 
We don't live kind of in a shame-based culture the way that they would have. But it's a pretty serious offense to show your legs. It would have been looked with shame from the community and others. But the father didn't care. He hitches up his tunic and it begins to run. As a kid, I was like, why is he running? Why can't he just walk? I mean, the sun's coming. I'm like, why can't you? Because I didn't understand the father's perspective, what Jesus was really trying to tell the listeners in the story. So he hitches up his tunic and begins to run. So you can say, well, why does he have to run? You know, again, because there is a tradition, it's called kizaza. You can look it up. The tradition is in that time, if a, if a young youth, a, a, a Jewish youth, would go off amongst the Gentile nations and spend all of his wealth and waste it all and then try to return to his community or the area where he would live, the leaders of that community would go out and meet him before he could enter into the city gates, before he could come back. They would carry a big pot with him and they would carry out and then they would, and right before he got there, they would smash it at his feet and they would say, you are cut off, you cannot come back. So now we get a better, clearer picture of why the father's running. It's a picture of how all of us are when we came. There is condemnation and judgment waiting for us all. And yet here is the father who so desires to want to reconcile his son that he's willing to take on the shame. Does it sound like somebody that we know? It should. (laughs) Because later on he's going to be doing this exact same thing, just doing it on a cross. He would take the shame in the, of the world upon his shoulder just so he could reconcile and restore his lost son. And then we see why. Well, he's going to beat the judgment. He's going to beat them. He's going to get there before they can be judged, before they can be condemned, before they can be like cast aside and cast off, never to be able to return. That's the love of our father. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And so then we see like, oh, that makes perfect sense now. He wraps his arms around his son, kisses him. He tells the servant to bring the robe, bring the ring. We're not just doing a half restoration. God doesn't just like fix half of us. He restores all of us. I don't know if you're here today and you say, I don't even know why I came today. I just came in and saw the church and thought I should come in today. And I mean, there was a draw with that. I'm going to tell you what that is. That is the Holy Spirit drawing you in to hear something that God wants you to tell you. We tell people all the time that God loves you. You know how many times I can tell you that many people I've ministered to that their life's been changed and they said, well, what was it that changed your life? They're like, I don't know. I've heard it a hundred times, but that one time, that one time that you said that God loved me, it became real to me. It became real. And it changed my life forever. It changed my family forever. That's the love of the father. He comes to the rescue of the son. And so then we go back and we see the same thing in the other stories of the lost sheep and the lost coin. They celebrate. When you came to know Jesus Christ, heaven threw a party. I don't know if you knew that or not. You might feel like, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say heaven threw a party whenever you became saved. You are that important. You are that special. You might not feel like you are. Okay. But you are. I'm telling you, I am your example. If God can use me, then he can use anybody. Okay. It's the truth. So then we come back and we celebrate. And then this is the other part of the story. Remember who we're talking to, tax collectors and sinners and Pharisees. And so then the older brother, who apparently would seem like the better brother, the better son, he's coming in. And there's another tradition that during banquets and during special times of holidays and celebrations, the son would be at the right hand of the father. The father would know that, the son would know that. And so when the son's coming in and he sees the celebration, his first thought would be, I need to get cleaned up. I need to go find where dad's at. And he needs to stand next to him. But what does he do? He stays outside and asks the servant to go, what's going on? And when he finds out, he is so indignant and angry. He's the only one in the Bible that we talk about where he throws accusations at the younger son. And obviously he's talking to the Pharisees. But what I love is the father still loves them that he goes and talks and beckons and asks. And I think about that sometimes too. Like how often can we get caught up in the routine of, of Christendom where we just, we go to church and we read our Bible, but we forget what the purpose of those things are, is to have a relationship with him and to get as many people as we can to heaven with us. Like that is the goal. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to step on any toes tonight. I, I really don't. Or today, it's not about how I feel, okay? It's not about my happiness, It's about his purpose and his kingdom. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's different. I'm not talking about the joy of the Lord inside of me. Sometimes the Lord is going to put you in a place. I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm just saying this. The Lord is going to put you in a place and it stinks. And you're like, Lord, why am I here? I'm going to tell you why. Because you're the one that God saw fit that could handle with it and deal with it and thrive where he puts you. 
And you know what? It's probably not even about you. You're just there because it's about somebody else. Now, that's contrary to anything that we believe that because as a Christian, it should be happy and joyful and fun for me. I don't know. I don't read a lot of that in the Bible. Okay? I, I don't believe you change. But that's a compliment. That's God saying, man, I see something in you that not the average person couldn't handle, but I see something you can handle this situation. You can be in the hard place. I think John Easter tells a story about, I mean, it's an incredible story. An African missionary, he goes to the Bible school. There's a place, and I don't know the whole story, but the, the question he asks is, it's a place where you're probably going to go and be sent to to die. It's at a Bible college and all these graduates. And he said, who's going to go to the hard place? And they begin to say, I want, send me, I'll go to the hard place. And the next one said, no, not him. You send me, send me to the hard place. That's, that's the kind of love, though, I think that we see from the Father. He'll put himself in the hard place to rescue us, to save us. So this morning, if we're going to close, <clears throat> first of all, I want to just ask everybody back here and close your eyes. <clears throat> I don't want to embarrass anybody. I won't. I promise you I won't. Uh, you can connect to me anytime if you want to talk, and I would encourage you to connect with all the pastors, this incredible staff here at this church. But if you're here today and you say, I, I don't know who that Jesus is. I don't know who the Heavenly Father you're talking about, but if it's like the man and the Father in this story that you told me, that will do whatever it takes to restore me, to redeem me, to save me, no matter what I've done. If that's the relationship you wanna know, if you wanna ask Jesus in your heart, if you wanna like start your life on that new journey, I just want you to slip your hand up. I'm not gonna call you out. I just wanna see if there's anybody in the house. First service, a young man raised his hand. I, I was so thankful that it's okay. If you're here and you're saying, I, I wanna have that relationship, I see that hand. Thank you for your honesty. We're going to pray together corporately, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I come here today a sinner that needs grace, that needs forgiveness, that needs to be saved. I believe, God, that you sent your son to this earth to die on a cross for my sins. That act paid the price, the consequence, the penalty for my sin. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I confess that he is now my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Jesus. I want to live for you all the days of my life. The good days and the bad days. Help me and lead me. I am yours. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, then I believe with all my heart that you started a journey with Jesus. It is the greatest journey. It's wild. That verse in Proverbs says, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make those paths straight. I can promise you, straight paths are not the way we envision straight paths. <laughs> but that chapter you don't understand that you're in right now, next chapter, it'll make perfect sense. And you can't have that next chapter without the chapter you're in that doesn't make any sense. So just trust the Lord, lean on him, all right? Next thing, I just wanna challenge you. This church has a legacy of being missions-minded and loving. But just like the older son, sometimes we can get caught up in the routine and we can miss out on what, what the passion is, the purpose of Jesus and his coming. For he came to seek and to save the lost. And so I just wanna challenge us, we don't become like the older brother because he wasn't praying for his younger brother. He wasn't going, he wasn't giving. He was, it was selfish in his mind. Like, I'm just doing this because I, I know what the prize is, heaven. I'm just gonna get to heaven. So if you don't pray, set some time apart to pray. It matters, it works. Put our missionary card on your, on your refrigerator, put all of them, just pray. You don't have to pray for 25 minutes, just pray for a minute every couple minutes. It's awesome how that'll work. You'll feel encouraged, your prayer works, somebody will be blessed because you pray. The next is giving. <laughs> it's kind of scary to say, but Test the Lord in this. You say, well, I don't want, you're, you're telling me, then don't give to me. Find another mission, ministry or missionary to give to and see what the Lord, just like the story that pastor told about this morning. I can't tell you how many times we've done that where I've been scared to death when the Lord's like, this is what you need to give. And I'm like, man, that's, that's everything, that's everything in the wallet, Lord, you know, that's, and it might not always be financially back, but he'll give peace. He's blessed us with one of the most incredible friends, ministry, I mean, just a support, cast like y'all that have supported us and prayed for us, God will bless you for giving. And the last is going. 
I don't, I don't know where you think you are, or if you think I'm too old, or I'm not good. I'm telling you, I am your example. I, I am not great. There's a hundred more people, thousands of more people more qualified to do deaf ministry than we are. But God called us to go, and all we can do is say, I'll be obedient or I'll be disobedient. And sometimes we gotta go back and we gotta slaughter the ox, we gotta tear up the plow, and we gotta give it all up to go follow Jesus. Financially, it won't make any sense, but God will take care of you. And some of you, it's not even about that. God isn't calling you to go overseas. He's calling you to like go into your neighborhood and your workplace and your school and your family. Get involved here at the church. Use your talents here. I know there's needs. I, I can't even imagine. I'm sure there's lots of needs that you're, you, God created you so specifically and detailed to do, to minister. There are people in this world that you can talk to and minister to that they would never give me the time of day. That's how special you are. So we're gonna close and pray and I'm gonna let pastor come, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, be in this place, fill this place, challenge us, Lord, challenge me and Didi and our family to pray more, to give more and to go. Lord, I, I pray that for the one that's, that's struggling with your call in their life, Lord, I pray that they would just release it to you and be free. God is still calling. In the last days, he's gonna pour out his spirit upon all flesh and he is calling more and more. It's the best decision they'll ever make in their life. I pray that you just encourage, they would feel the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. For those to pray that they would feel, Lord, they would be encouraged to know that their prayers do matter. They are, they are hitting the mark. They are getting and reaching the ears of God and he hears them. Lord, I pray that you just bless us today, Lord God. Bless this congregation, Lord, as they support missions, as they support the missions locally right here in Fort Wayne and then also globally around the world. Bless the pastors and the staffs and the ministry team here. My God, because as you bless them, Lord, I know that they're gonna turn around and bless others and they're gonna grow your kingdom. Lord, we give you the precious praise and glory that you deserve. In your heavenly name we pray.